Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining the panel on COVID-19. Shea Hope McDonald Lone Tree Yenshia Todachitni Nishle Hashkaha Soho Bashishin Naafani Eda Shate Aro Batani Eda Shanela. COVID-19, as each of you know, here today dramatically impacted our communities because of the disproportionate health disparities, including access to health care and increased underlying medical conditions among Native people. I am happy to present this panel to you today. I'm currently the Deputy Commissioner at the Administration for Native Americans, and today our panel will focus on the important Native American response to um, protecting our elders and our families, our entire community. We will also hear about the resilience and strength of tribal people and their leadership during the pandemic. Is my camera working? Your camera's okay. currently off. All right. All of us here at ACF would like to acknowledge and recognize individuals in your communities that are doing spectacular work, making a positive impact in the livelihoods of others and or supporting women's issues. We are showcasing individuals that have been nominated by you all during our closing ceremonies this Thursday, starting at 6.45 p.m. Eastern time. We want to highlight as many of our indigenous local heroes as we can on screen during our closing celebrations so to nominate um, a local hero from your community, please send their name, photo, where they live, and a short blurb of what they are doing in their community and to our and send it to our communication specialist, I apologize, Jamie Murphy, and she will share her contact information in the chat for you. So before we begin, I would like to um, introduce uh, the Mr. Milton Bluehouse Jr., who is uh, Navajo and comes from a long line lineage of Navajo leaders, who will do our opening prayer. Mr. Bluehouse. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner McDonald Lone Tree. I appreciate the opportunity to provide the opening prayer for a very important conversation. I wanted to humbly request that all of our participants for this particular meeting take a moment to center themselves in recognition of the presence of the sacred. And we will begin our prayer with the traditional Navajo invocation of the deities. And then we'll go on into our acknowledgement of the Creator's blessing in our lives. Na San, Mother Earth, Sohana'e, Father, Son, Asanatlehe, Changing Woman, Yadeshir, Universe, Hashjayashi, Talking God. Home God, Dance Dash Key, White Corn Boy, the Dance Sweet Eight Yellow Corn Girl, Tadibinish Key, Corn Pollen Boy, Danish Anyat Eight Pollinator Girl, Hasan Lady Kehojon, the Harmony, the Beauty, Peace, the Balance, for which all of creation is based upon, the Internet, Donald Thing, all creators. Nina, Jesus, all of the indigenous deities for all of the indigenous peoples from all of the indigenous communities across the world and for those who are joining our conversation today. Creator, we thank you for the blessings of family and the community, of our relatives, our elders, our children, for the revival of life after the sacred winter. Creator, we remember our relatives we lost during the pandemic. Accept them into your home, reunite them with our ancestors. Creator, be with our relatives who remain here with us. Heal their broken hearts, strengthen their spirits, comfort them and restore their happiness. Creator, bless our leaders, President Nez, Dana Grant, Roberta Townsend Benel, Selena Jesus, Kune Kekuaha, Dr. Dillard, and all of our indigenous leaders across all of our indigenous communities and all of our community leaders as well. We thank you for their blessings of leadership throughout the pandemic. We thank you for their rallying efforts to protect our communities, particularly our elders and our children. 
May you bless them, bless their families. And Heavenly Father, the Creator, we pray for special blessings for our communities, for a full, vibrant, and beautiful recovery. We humbly ask for blessings for our families, for our elders, for our children, for our aunts and uncles, mothers and fathers, nephews, nieces, and grandchildren, that their health will be fully restored, that their spirits will be strengthened, and that we will all continue on with resiliency, with kindness, with love, and with respect and the acknowledgement of the sacred in all of our lives. We end our prayer now with the acknowledgement of the restoration of beauty. Ujo Nahaslin may be returned to beauty. Ujo Nahaslin may be returned to beauty. Ujo Nahaslin may be returned to beauty. Ujo Nahaslin, it is now in beauty. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Lontree. Yeah, Mr. Bluhaus, greatly appreciate those uh, sacred words, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce right now our um, opening speaker, President Jonathan Nez, who serves as the elected Navajo Nation president and also as a primary administration for children and families tribal advisory committee delegate. So um, with that, please help me welcome President Nez. Right, those that are on the uh, the Zoom. Uh, good afternoon, um, Jonathan Nez. Uh, for all our Navajo relatives. Uh, thank you for that prayer, Milton. Uh, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, thank you for your leadership as well, um, being a part of our administration for some time. Also, uh, my sister, uh, Hope McDonald Lone Tree, our deputy commissioner, again, congratulations to your appointment. We look forward to uh, continued uh, partnership with ACF. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Canestra, thank you so much for uh, the work that you have been doing as deputy and now uh, leading the, the agency as well. Now, uh, I do have a PowerPoint uh, presentation and just to quickly go over uh, our presentation. You know, that picture there uh, went viral uh, where we were out there during the COVID-19 pandemic helping you know, our people uh, during the times of need for like for food and hand sanitizers and really coming together. And that's what I appreciate about ACF, uh, the focus on our children and our elders and our elders are the holder of our culture, our ways of life and our, our teaching. And that there just showed that, uh, you know, we, we will get through this pandemic. And our current numbers as of yesterday, um, 52,822 total confirmed cases, uh, recovery 51,063, uh, and total confirmed deaths, uh, sadly 1,658 of our Navajo people have lost uh, loved ones and uh, or have, have lost their lives and our families out there uh, are you know, healing through this difficult time. And we only had two positive cases yesterday with zero deaths. And if you look at the, the comparison between the United States, which is the, the darker uh, line, the bottom left, and the brown orange is the Navajo Nation. You know, this Navajo Nation has, you know, gone through about three, surges, major surges, while the country has gone through four uh, major surges. Uh, and we've seen some all some low numbers lately. And then the last, uh, the bottom 
right corner is our vaccination rate. 75% uh, of our Navajo people are uh, vaccinated. One and two boosters are still uh, being administered. And then there's a breakdown of age category, but I want you to look at the 89%, 65 years and older, our elders took this pandemic very seriously and gotten vaccinated, 89%. I'll come back to that in a bit. The reasoning I think of our elders really taking the charge on the Navajo Nation and getting vaccinated. If you go to the second slide, the Navajo Nation is the largest land base uh, nation in the country, 27,000 square miles. Uh, we are in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. <laughs> uh, there are, as of uh, this past week, 403,000 uh, in, 403, enrolled members. And we got national attention, you know, because of the high infection rate uh, per capita in this country, but we turned it around. The Navajo people turned it around and now we are a model, as the Dr. Fauci says, a model of how uh, a region can push back on COVID-19. Now, if you go to the next slide, the first case of COVID-19 or the Kosinskagina in Nahastates Atta, we gave the Navajo name, uh, was detected in March of 2020. And uh, within the month, the nation declared a public health uh, emergency. We had established a Navajo Nation Council, I mean, COVID-19 response team. Before there was a, a first case to be found on Navajo, we created a preparedness team. And if we were a state, they, we would have probably been the 48th state to get a confirmed positive case in the country. That's how well, you know, we prepared, I think. But, you know, we're right in the middle of the country. And of course, it's gonna come in to our Navajo Nation. Uh, we um, authorized the Navajo Nation Department of Health to oversee uh, the nation uh, in terms of public health emergency orders. We had to do some very strict protocols, 57 hour weekend curfews, mask mandates. Matter of fact, mask mandates are still in place. So overall, all our public health emergency orders uh, have been many. And three this year, 20 in 2021, 32 in 22. And we uh, took our um, ability to govern ourselves very seriously. We put some, uh, some very strict protocols in place. Uh, our, the, if you go to the next slide, uh, we also uh, declared major, a major disaster declaration. Uh, you know, we are one of uh, a couple of tribes that have the ability to declare a major disaster declaration. Matter of fact, uh, Milton Blue House Jr. was instrumental in helping us get that ma major disaster declaration from the White House. And uh, what we did there is when we developed our uh, response response team, we brought many of the agencies together. And we didn't have to, but we knew it was important to have federal agencies be a part of these types of coordination. FEMA, CDC, IHS, uh, Navajo Nation programs, um, and many others uh, were coming together. And we called it the Unified Command Group, Coordination Group where we discussed uh, you know, what we needed to do to push back on COVID-19. And so based on the government to government relationship, we were able to uh, get the White House and federal agencies a part of these discussions. Uh, we developed an incident command system with various agencies, uh, including our Navajo Nation programs. And we were out there, as I was mentioning earlier, we were out there uh, there's 110 communities we reached, we visited all 110 communities, being out there delivering PPE, food, uh, just getting information out to our Navajo people. And I, I thought it, it would be very important that, you know, the Navajo people see their leaders out in their communities, because that was a scary time, especially when there was no uh, vaccine. 
you know, we feared for our health and well-being, but I knew it was important for us to be out in the community. So that was one uh, part of um, our, our success. If you go to the next slide, you know, the impact on female emergency declaration as uh, the Navajo Nation being one of three tribes with a major disaster declaration, as I was mentioning earlier, we brought in resources for crisis counseling services, uh, reimbursements, even uh, funeral expense, getting technical support and doing town hall meetings and letting our Navajo people know that there are resources out there that can help during these difficult times. We uh, did isolation and quarantine in our communities. We took over some hotels some gymnasiums, appreciate the Army Corps of Engineers for helping transition uh, those facilities into uh, quarantine and isolation units. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, I, the, the key elements of public health in, information for the Navajo people to understand COVID and the protocol. You know, we utilize our, our Navajo language. We also use our teaching, our way of life teaching. You know, I share this with many, and I think that's the reason why there's a big uh, support and uh, amount of elders who've gotten the, the vaccine. You know, in, in our way of life story, you know, through the prayer that was just done by Milton and what Hope also mentioned about our, our ways and our, our, our life teaching, you know, there's stories that are handed down from generation to generation. And we used our teaching. We said, you know, the, the, the hero twins came to the Navajo people um, uh, many, a, a long time ago, and they were given weapons and they were given armor to fight off monsters. And those time, those days, the, the, moder, the, the monsters were, you know, old age, hunger, poverty, lice, you know, yeah, lice, meaning that, you know, personal hygiene. And these hero twins fought these monsters off. And, and it's no different today, the modern day monsters. We got alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, PTSD, and now you got COVID-19. And, and we just continue to let our people know, you know, we got to warrior up. We got to wear our masks, which are our, our weapons, our, co uh, our vaccination, or our armor, you know? And I think when we framed it in that way, um, many of our Navajo people understood the importance. It wasn't just about individualistic way of thinking, like you're taking away my freedoms, you're not gonna force me to wear a mask, or you're taking away my freedoms, you're not gonna force me to stay at home. But it was more about community. It was more about family. It was helping out uh, and keeping our, our people safe, our families safe, our community safe, and our nation safe. Go to the next slide. Uh, we, we utilize town halls, matter of fact, Today, we had a town hall meeting uh, to continue to get this message out uh, to our communities. And as you can see there, you know, continue, we, we continue to uh, use the radio, we uh, use the newspaper, uh, door to door, even though some didn't allow folks in, but did our very best to get the information. Information was key and infrastructure is needed to get that. Uh, a message out, broadband, telecommunication, electricity uh, is needed to get the message out. If you go to the next slide, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I kind of already ran out of time, but if you go to the next slide, uh, I just want to end by, by saying too that uh, we are all in this together. Uh, and I think many indigenous tribes throughout the, the country uh, did their very best in pushing back on COVID, but the infrastructure in place uh, is in need of repair, especially when it comes to the healthcare systems. I think because of what we went through, that we saw the deficiencies, not in just tribal communities, but all across the country, the deficiencies in uh, the healthcare systems. But it's, um, you know, programs like the ACF and funding that comes through to that will help you know, heal a lot of our people, you know, suicide prevention programs are, are needed uh, more um, behavioral mental health services. And uh, I think that into the well into the future, we are going to be uh, resilient overcomers 
in pushing back on viruses like COVID-19 or any other bug that comes into this United States of America or into our tribal community. So did, uh, did the very best I can in the time allotted to me, uh, but I appreciate if you want any other questions, please reach out to us, uh, the Navajo Nation. We don't mind sharing a lot more of what uh, we've done. And it's been, like I said, a model that's been uh, shared with Dr. Fauci or Dr. Berla at Pfizer in the White House. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, Hope uh, McDonald Lone Tree and uh, leadership at ACF. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, Shastila, really appreciate you spending the time with us today and sharing um, the challenges and the various ways that you navigated, helped us navigate on the ground on Navajo. And we greatly appreciate your leadership on our Tribal Advisory Council. So thank you again. If you are willing to stay with us for a bit, some people may have some questions for you at the end. Um, otherwise, we understand if you have a busy schedule and are not able to remain with us again. Um, so moving right along, I just wanted to say each grant recipient presenting here today was asked to provide a brief overview of their grant project. They will describe the challenges their team faced while implementing their projects during this time. As well, they will be talking about how they resolved and overcame some of these challenges. And we hope that this will be an inspiration for you and uh, those that you work with and how um, these various hardships may have been overcome. Now I will open the floor to Mr. Dana Grant from ACF's Office of Early Childhood Development, Tribal, Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. That's a lot of words there. Mr. Grant helped develop the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes Home Visiting Program and is the current grant program's evaluator. So please help me welcome uh, Mr. Grant to provide us with their presentation today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here and our time is limited, so I'll be fast and furious. As Hope said, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program has been going now for over a decade, and the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, of which I'm an evaluator for their program, has had one for over eight years. It's been a great program for our community, benefiting young families and their children, helping them develop skills, learning about parenting techniques, and connecting back to culture based on our own history here and our own tribal people. Through the program, families have had the opportunity to also learn about different tools and ways to access resources in the community. If you wanna go ahead and bring up the slideshow, that would be great. So today I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the last couple of years in how our community and specifically the home visiting program responded to the challenges and everything that was brought to us from COVID. As was already mentioned, of course, for most communities, it was like an unexpected wave that came from out of the blue and none of us were really prepared for that. For our own group here on the reservation and working with the home visiting team, we've always focused on relationships, those personal connections, how you're able to engage with someone and build that up. So that was already in place as a core piece of our early foundations home visiting program. We utilize a national curriculum model to help with our program, and we're able to infuse it with our own ideas, traditions, and cultural practices. Go ahead and change the slide. So when we first came into the COVID pandemic two years ago, we had to change our whole approach. And as with so many other agencies and programs, we had to think about what can we keep doing that will be safe, that will take care of our families, but will also help us maintain that relationship that we've established. So those family connections, which is really at the core of home visiting, was one of the first things we really had to think about. And of course, we could not do in person as we had been doing historically. So we had to make modifications that included thinking creatively, meeting on porches, dropping items off, and a lot of texting and a lot of FaceTime. Of course, fortunately, the families are more tech savvy than us, so that was no problem for them to make that adaptation. 
And we quickly caught on that they wanted that link. No matter what was happening in the world, our community or wherever we were at, they needed that reassurance. And so we recognized quickly and working with our other tribal agencies and partners, thought about how can we maintain that human engagement? And I think for us overall, that's really the message that we wanna share from our program was that vital, vital part of being linked to someone on a very authentic, genuine and caring way. That was what guided us. Our tribe did shut down for a period of time. So departments were closed, people were at home. So again, we thought, okay, well, what can we do? So over time, we developed a lot of different drop-off items, little packages, some with some herbal remedies, some with some goodies, some with some educational materials or books, and others that just had a little bit of a oomph to help boost their spirits and energy. We also thought ways to connect these families back to the things that they vitally needed, such as food. And again, there was a huge program within our community that our team, as well as others were a part of, that helped get food out, distributing it, dropping it off, or creating safe ways for people to come get it for themselves. Of course, it wouldn't be totally honest to talk about the situation without recognizing the community divisions that did take place at times. We as a reservation community are in a unique situation as opposed to some, because we are split between a tribal and a non-tribal population in a very big way. And so that's one piece of this division. And then the other division was along the political lines, which all of us saw around the country, that those who were pro-vaccine, against the vaccine, for vaccine, um, in our own town, even we had businesses across the street that were aligned in different camps. Of course, that impacted our families and the children we serve. It made them anxious. It made them fearful and unsure. So our staff and the rest of our partners within the tribe and non-tribal community really tried to identify ways that we could best serve those individuals by being a reassuring place, providing them with a sense of calm, a sense of focus, and most of all, optimism about the future. Because amongst all of these terrible things that were happening, of course, people were losing family members. Early on, of course, it was a large number of people sick, hospitalization levels. As with other indigenous communities, we saw a high percentage of individuals suffering. And over time, those illnesses turned to death and our families faced those losses. We thought of different ways to help families mourn about ways that they could still honor their celebrations and community events in a new way. It was very difficult. I think we all know how hard and challenging it was. But again, those relationships, those core level of compassion, that's what we wanted to share with people and that's what we tried to do as best we could. Go ahead and change the slide. Now, we are regrouping as everyone is. But we learned a great deal. And I guess that's the other part of what we'd like to share. Let's not forget those lessons. Let's not have this situation come again without us being better equipped for whatever it might be. We certainly know we were not. The one thing that we did have was a willingness to adapt, a willingness to be creative, and a willingness to not lose the value of those relationships. So those little pieces we kept in place, and that helped guide us. It helped move us to where we needed to be. Most of all, and this is always hard to do, we were honest with each other, with our families, and with our community partners about the uncertainty we were feeling. No one tried to hide behind it. We, we thought about transparency, and we let that guide us. Let us teach us that we could be open and that we could share this challenge and come out better by doing that. Next slide, please. Through that sharing and engagement, we were able to move forward. And now we are excited, as everyone is, to look ahead. Last slide, please. So sharing the journey, we are together. That's really what we want to say. As you look at this last slide, it's, it's a picture of here in our valley across the lake. And 
one final thing that we as an indigenous community really thought was important was recognizing our connection to nature. So we tried to maintain that in the best way we could. And that was a place where people could go and be safe. So we utilized that and we would encourage others to do that going forward. Thank you for allowing me to tell a little bit about our story from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe in Montana. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Greatly appreciate those words and how you were able to successfully navigate and encouraging um, an encouragement to our fellow grantees. Thank you again. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ms. Roberta Townsend Venel, who is the project director for Kodiak Archipelago Leadership Institute in Alaska. She is an ANA grant recipient. Ms. Townsend Vanell. Um, thank you, Ms. McDonald. And could we share the PowerPoint, please? And I have to apologize. I need to stay off video because our internet has been very unstable lately. I think that's something we can all understand. Anyway, um, I'm Robbie Townsend Vennell with the Kodiak Archipelago Leadership Institute loaded, located in Kiktuk or Kodiak, the homeland of the Koniak Sukpiak or Lutik people. Kodiak is home to six small communities and the regional hub of Kodiak, home to 10 federally recognized tribes. As an island-wide community, we're only accessible by air or water and our small villages located around the island whose farms logos you can see here are only accessible by small air charter. And Kali is a community-based nonprofit organization and our mission is to support the sustainability of our Lutic communities. Next slide, please. So a little about our project, we were funded in late September of 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Kali has been working to support the establishment of small farms in our rural communities for the past eight years. And with Supet Nerawakluki, we are feeding our people. We are establishing year round hydroponic food production in these remote Alaskan communities. Um, that include self-contained cabinets and containerized growing system farms supported by a comprehensive training program. And also we're developing a, a food hub. If we could have the next slide, please. So just some quick pictures. These are what the self-contained cabinets look like that are going out to our, they're already in our villages and they're kicking out a lot of food. Next slide, please. And the containerized growing system is currently being manufactured. It will be in Kodiak, um, gosh, next month. And this thing is gonna be able to produce 20,000 heads of lettuce a year. Next slide, please. And finally, we're developing a food, an online food hub, not only to move around food that the tribal farms are producing, but also we're looking at possibly being able to move donated subsistent foods around, particularly in the Kodiak for elders in the senior care system. Next slide, please. So what were our challenges? I think these have all been addressed. Our biggest one was maintaining community safety in this Un, an unexpected crazy COVID environment. That top picture is the first load of rapid testing coming into the Kodiak State Airport. Um, and then our remote location, logistics, internet, restricted travel, really shut us down for a period of time. And it's still really, really difficult. We're moving around the island again. We're going to have our first in-person get together at the end of April with our team. The first one in over two years. Acute food shortages, we are at basically the end of the food chain um, with everything having to be barged or flown up. And then everything of everyone so far has touched on this. How do we keep our community spirit up in the midst of such profound loss? And as we started implementing our project, we realized that our project couldn't have been more timely because we were all about food. So if I could have the next slide, please. How did we respond as a small nonprofit organization trying to implement a project in the midst of all of this? We had a lot of help from two strong regional, corp regional entities, the Kodiak Area Native Association, who is our regional in, uh, native um, health provider, and Koniag, who is our regional Alaska Native Corporation. And Canna really took the lead on safety during COVID. 
they were really amazing at getting rapid testing out for villages, establishing rapid testing sites in Kodiak. But what was really important for all of us is a regional community that we can't drive around to see each other was the Kodiak Canada Roundtable that would have regular meetings where Canada, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, would um, come come online and would share updates about what was happening, where you could get rapid testing, what was the status of hospitalization. And all of these allowed us to make good decisions at our project team level. And then Coniag financially supported the farms during this period as well because of the food security need. Next slide, please. And then at our project level, what happened was this brought our regional farming team, our Aleutic grown farming team, really, really close together. We had to develop workarounds because of our crazy internet. We had one village whose internet went down for two months. Um, what we were doing there was when we were having critical trainings that we converted to virtual, we'd actually get them into Kodiak where they could get on good internet and participate. But our regional team was the platform that allowed us to develop our solutions as we went forward with project implementation. The cabinet delivery was really problematic because it was timed, it was hitting right in the middle of the pandemic before we had vaccines. And we talked about, well, do we pull it back? And the team said, absolutely not. We need this food production. So we worked with the manufacturer and they came up with an idea of, well, let's ship the cabinets out broken down. We can ship them out on small planes, put them together in the villages and keep our food production online. And then the other challenge we have is that the Produce Alliance safety training that really all food growers should go through. This is a national international program. They had never delivered that project virtually, that program virtually before. And so we were faced with how do we get our people training and we worked with the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation and they worked with the national program. And I think we were one of the first states to deliver produce safety allowance virtually. And so we were able to get all of our workers through that. And then we developed contact list deliveries. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is just a few pictures of, there we are. The upper left is um, one of those broken down cabinets on a caravan out at Island Air. Um, there, the same cabinets being unloaded in the community of Uzinki. In the middle, you can see one of the cabinets in operation. Um, you can see the lettuce bagged up and ready to go. And then here's delivery to two of our elders in Kodiak. So we implemented this project in the middle of COVID. We had these cabinets up and running by April of 2021, and we're getting ready to do a whole lot more. Next slide, please. So I think everyone has shared this message and this is our message from Kodiak. We have this really beautiful song called Uhe Uhe about together we're strong, that when we work together, we won't suffer, we won't have a hard time, and we will be strong people. And I would just like to say next slide, please, Kuyana. Thank you for listening to our story from Kodiak. And just everybody, please be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Townsend Vanell. That was that's really truly an amazing project. And I tried to catch up with you after you said that there were two months without internet. Um, if those of you are old, as old as I am know and can imagine that because we were we weren't we were here before the internet. But um, we it is very good to know the enormous challenges that are out there and ways that we have to get around it so that, so that we can continue to serve our people. So thank you again for sharing that. Now I'd like to introduce Selena Jesus, who is a Senior Director of Programs and Tribal Relations um, from an ANA grant recipient, Native American Advancement Foundation. Selena? Hi, uh, I'm Selena Jesus, I'm Gotcha. Um, good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this webinar today. My name is Selena Jesus. I come from the um, Donaldum Nation. I uh, we are current. We're located at the very southwest end of our nation, and 
to kind of give you a, a pick an idea of where we're located is I'm like 20 miles from the US Mexico international border. So we're one of the border districts here on the nation. Um, I've been working for NAF uh, for the past nine years now. And, um, you know, during this whole pandemic, you know, like all the nations, the whole United States, the whole world, you know, it's been affected very hard, you know, hardships through this whole uh, pandemic and having to adjust and adapt to services that we provide, you know, we had to really think creatively and how we were going to overcome some of the obstacles that we had to in order to provide services. And uh, NAF, the Native American Advancement um, Foundation, is a nonprofit uh, organization located here in, in our district. We're just one of the 11 districts of the, the nation. Um, we um, a lot of our, our services that we provide is uh, we gather data from a survey, an annual survey that we conduct every year at um, an, a district day that we have here in, in our district. And because of COVID, you know, we weren't able to get the, have the survey uh, conducted in the past, you know, two years. And so, you know, a lot of our, our, our um, programs that we, we do provide or that we develop are, from feedback that we get from our community members, our district members, the nation members, and it's all grassroots, you know, it's like, what are the needs that that we can serve? You know, how can we serve you? And so one of the projects that we've done and, uh, be, you know, being that we're a ANA uh, recipient was the EMIC project. EMIC is really, you know, work for kin kinship. And it was a two part project that, you know, when we first developed it. And the reason for this was to have, you know, for us to go out and have roundtable discussions with our elders to gather data that where we can build a curriculum that we can uh, teach in our after school program. And so, you know, building the curriculum to teach the autumn language to our students, you know, when COVID hit, that was just one thing that we couldn't we couldn't do again the whole nation shut down because and it was by executive order and the emic project was really to go out to each community in our district we have four communities and we were going to have roundtable discussions with the elders to gather information about uh, sacred sites geological areas um, again just the language uh, ceremonies that were practice, you know, with, with some of the families that still do today. And it's, you know, when COVID hit, we just, again, the nation shut down, we had to reassess, you know, how can we still get information that we could. Um, and so we developed a, we created a packet. And with that packet, it was pretty much the questions that were going to be asked um, during the, the, the interviews. And, you know, it was just, again, it wasn't really what we were planning for or what we wanted to do because, you know, in traditional, in traditional ways, we would sit down and have a conversation with the elders and gather the information that we need. But again, you know, that, that was one thing we couldn't do. And so we created packets and we were able to go out and give the packets to the elders and then, you know, have their family member or a caregiver help them uh, fill out the, the survey and, and, you know, give it back to us. So we were able to gather data uh, that way. Um, and then with one of the, the other things, again, you know, with the challenges, it was the, you know, we had to learn to go learn tech, go technical, you know, we had to go learn to go, uh, you know, have, what is it? Uh, over the internet, you know how we're doing right now, we're having a Zoom meeting, we had to adjust and learn to that. And those are some of the challenges that we have here on the nation because of the lack of infrastructure, the lack of experience and how to use technology. And, you know, having, you know, to go back and look at what we can do, um, it was like, okay, reaching out to the communities and our, our district governing council here, and our tribal leadership, like we need help, you know, how can you assist us in doing this? And so we were able to have set up these virtual conversations with our elders and gather, still gather the information that, 
that we needed uh, to build this curriculum. And with some of the executive orders, you know, the, that are being lifted, now we're being able to slowly go out and still, you know, conduct the interviews and, and gather the information that we need. Um, and again, you know, still, you know, another thing that we did was we were able to virtually still teach the autumn language in our, to our after school recipients, our participants that we have. And so we're still able, again, to make that connection and still be able to teach the language. And one of the other things that we were able to do was the capacity building, which is, you know, teaching some of our staff here who are non autumn speakers to at least, you know, learn uh, the, the language. And so with that, you know, we were still able, again, to engage families that were able to participate in some of the culture activities, either if it was in person or, you know, at home or online. Um, and then also we are looking at, you know, uh, are looking, we are looking at doing our, our, uh, our first, uh, it's a pilot project this year, we're having an autumn immersion camp um, this summer. And so I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully this will be something that we can, you know, still do annually. Um, but again, having to overcome this whole, you know, COVID, uh, um, you know, that, that, you know, was, um, it, it's here uh, on our nation, you know, having to adjust, this is just something that we have done on our end, you know, and again, I really want to thank, you know, um, ANA again for the funding that, so we are able to continue to provide services uh, for our people and for everybody else that, you know, this, we are all in this together. And I, again, I just want to share with everybody to continue to be strong and we will, we will you know, overcome this whole pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jesus. We greatly appreciate you sharing and um, many things to learn from you and your project. And we are so happy that you were able to um, utilize the funding that um, we have at ANA. At this time, I'd like to introduce Associate Director Puni Kakao Oa and and the executive director, Dr. Adrian Dillard of ANA grant recipient, Kula Nona Poe Hawaii. Aloha, I don't good, know morning. What... good morning from Papakolea oh. in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, we're very happy to present to you our, our journey to the last two years in, uh, with COVID. So my name is Puni, I'm the associate director. To my right, your left is Adrian, Dr. Adrian Dillard. She is the executive director of Kula Nonapo e Hawaii. Kula Nonapo e Hawaii is a community-based organization. We've been together, we've been formed since uh, for the past 30 years, providing services to our kupuna in Papakolea, Kevalo, and Kalavahine homestead. Uh, we can go ahead and put up this first slide. Thank you, mahalo. So the Papakolea Kupuna Community Care Network was established in 2017 as a one-stop shop for Papakolea Kupuna and their caregivers for increased access to information and services. The goal of KCCN is to empower families to support our Kupuna to safely age in place. At the end of September, 2020, Kupuna in the KCCN program totaled 319. KCCN two was expanded to use the use of technology and health services COVID-19, create COVID-19 education and training and address home and community safety. When COVID-19 uh, created this worldwide shutdown in March of 2020, KCCN staff quickly adapted to continue serving our community kupuna elders, uh, we refer to as kupuna and their caregivers. The COVID-19 pandemic presented new challenges and issues that this community never experienced before. We saw increased needs with Papakolea, and the three main concerns were to address food security, public health, and home and community safety. Some of the direct challenges faced at this time included social isolation for our kupuna, homelessness, which was an area we had never really responded to and we lacked knowledge in, 
Kapuna safety concerns with all families members being at home with the shutdowns and our inability to actually go in and look at home re disrepair, which was um, on the target for our KCCN grant. Next slide, please. Additionally, we needed to take all of our programs which were planned to be in person to a online format. And that was a challenge because we had staff who were hired to do in person that did not have the technology skills, as well as some of our kupuna who had just decided they did not want to learn how to do uh, computers and were not going to embrace that. So as we began to use, look at the use of technology, it created additional challenges that we needed to address. So the first area of um, that we address in a way of pandemic response, just wanted to share that when Kula, when, when COVID hit us in March of 2020, the, the, the advantage that we had in Papakolea as a result of the Kupuna program was that there was an infrastructure that was, that was created to take care of our Kupuna. And that infrastructure is what allowed us to be able to jump in and you know, begin to outreach to Kupuna and the larger community. So in the area of food security, uh, we were had the great blessing and honor to partner with many organizations in Honolulu and on Oahu. And, you know, we partnered with organizations such as Malama Meals, Lunadilo Homes, Lanakila Meals on Wheels. And we were especially blessed to have the partnerships to receive USDA food boxes. So all of these funders and organizations partnered with us to provide 80,023 meals and 15,030 box lunches and meal sets to Oahu families. Um, this dynamic, uh, this picture right here is one of two Sundays that Papakolea had a food drive. And this was all done and, and really spearheaded by members of community who are from Papakolea who are part of the Oahu Hawaiian Canoe Racing Association and Punahou School. Next slide. In partnership with local health clinics, we did four COVID testing events. We're serving 288 residents. We did two flu clinic drives, as well as we had 845 uh, at-home test kits were distributed, as well as the number of, in partnership with Kaiser COVID vaccination clinics, which we're still doing up to today. Uh, we were able to really serve our Kupuna who had initially reached out to us to say they wanted vaccination clinics in community because the lines were so long as they first started to ramp up. So we were able to, based on partnerships that we have, bring in a host of not only staff, but volunteers, as well as our academic partnerships, because we were able to bring in nursing students from our local universities to help facilitate some of the clinics that we were able to provide in our public health grants. Additionally, because we had social workers on staff, when we were informed of the challenges a number of people were having that were houseless, that lived in community, we were able to bring in our social workers to go to the streets to actually find out how we could help facilitate what was going on because many families saw that many people were returning home because they were losing jobs and income was not stable. And so we are still working. We have provided homeless services to over 30. We see a number of kupuna who were on the street that are now housed. So we continue to do this work today. Community safety became a big challenge because once again, everybody was home. And so we actually kicked off a culturally tailored community safety event working with our local police department so that we could make people more aware of, once again, watching out for Kupuna and being mindful of following process to, to report crime because like every other community, the catalytic converters and things that uh, people were starting to steal and stuff that was being highlighted during the course of pandemic. So, you know, one of the great areas of challenge was just, you know, was understanding and working to help those of our community who were living on the sidewalks and living on the streets. Uh, never before has our organization taken a proactive step to really 
you know, work with the systems in place. And, you know, we have to admit the systems in Honolulu to address homelessness are broken. Um, as far as we were uh, working, they were not serving those that were in need in our community. And, and we all know in Honolulu and Oahu at, 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 as a whole. And uh, having placed people out uh, to do this work really was um, not just a challenge, but very rewarding for our community and our organization. In moving forward, we're really excited. Uh, we're actually gonna have our kickoff with our kupuna in space uh, very soon. And uh, we're looking forward to returning to in-person classes. So we will bring kupuna back in this year and this coming year, we will be having advanced care planning classes. We'll restart our home visits with our kupuna with multidisciplinary, well, multidisciplinary student teams. And we will begin an Ike Kupuna uh, program. It's a research study that observes the effects of hula on age-related dementia. So we are very appreciative and uh, of the support from ANA and all of our ohana. And we wish to thank all of you. Mahalo nui from Papakolea. Aloha no. Aloha. Thank you. Yeah. Mahalo Nui, and thank you to our Ohana and Hawaii. So we thank you very much for joining us, and we love your project, and we hope that we can continue to work with you and learn best practices and ways that we can continue to navigate this pandemic. So again, thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone has any quick questions for the uh, presenters. We are quickly running out of time. Um, feel free to add any to the chat, and I'll hand it over to Anna right now. Hello everyone, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and raise your hand um, through the raise hand function on your Zoom toolbar, or you can go ahead and put a question in the chat. Anna, is there a networking session also that some of these presenters will be at? that people can uh, talk with them later? We have the, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, networking session uh, later this evening. Okay. Great. Deputy Commissioner, I don't see any questions. Oh, we, I do see one from Helen from the chat and this is for uh, Robbie where did Kodiak um, get the cabinets and what was the price for the cabinets and larger unit um, we worked with vertical harvest hydroponics out of Anchorage and Palmer Alaska um, the cabinet pricing has changed quite a bit since we initially contracted with them so I'm hesitant to, I think a ballpark price would be probably $8,000. And this is for a new expanded version that can produce, so oh, uh, it's got about 50, 55 ports in it. And then the big cabinet runs around $170,000 and it produces up to 20,000 heads of lettuce or greens a year. Um, I don't know if Vertical Harvest is sold to the lower 48. I do know they sell in Alaska and Canada. Thank you, Robbie. We have one more question from Lorraine. Mike, how did the community accommodate the families on quarantine with food? Is that for Kodiak? Is, is this for Kodiak, Lorraine? Yes. So the Kodiak Area Native Association did food distributions that would come, the food would be flown from Kodiak to the villages, and then the tribal councils would be responsible for distributing the food. But even with that, we had a lot of food shortages. Um, there, it was really hard to get certain things, um, but primarily through Canna, there was food distribution, particularly to the elders and tribal families. And then our program, Alutic Grown, was also distributing food that we grew in our forest soil farms 
in Port Lyons, Larson Bay, Old Harbor, and Uzinki. And those soil farms and the hydroponics are currently expanding beyond what we're doing with the ANA grant with CARES and ARPA funding. Our hope is that by the end of the ARPA cycle, our villages will be pretty much growing everything they need. Thank you, Robbie. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I think we, I don't see any additional questions. Okay. Thank you, Aheha, mahalo. We greatly appreciate all of the time that you spent with us today. We wanted to just feature as many, and you can see that it took a lot more time because we wanted to share so much with you. Um, we will have other uh, grantees present throughout the week during our conference, so please join us again. And thank you. Have a great day and be safe.